Well, good morning, Crossfire Assembly. Praise the Lord. Glad to be here to see all your smiling faces. Wait a minute, I said smiling faces. <laughs> They're ginger smiling. Well, let's stand up. Let's uh, greet one another really quick here. And we're just going to spend a little bit of time worshiping the Lord this morning. Hallelujah.
glory to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We serve such a wonderful God, amen. Lord, I just thank you today that we can come to worship you. Thank you, I thank you, Lord, for our church family, Lord. I thank you for our brethren. That we can come together and encourage each other in the Lord. That we can worship you and to give you honor and glory to whom all honor is due. That name of Jesus. That name above all other names. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Jesus. 
Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Spirit, you're welcome here this morning. You're here. Jesus, you're here. Where two or three are gathered, you said you were here. And we look to you, Lord. You are our hope. You are our joy. You're our strength in this hour that we live. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
If you want a touch from the Lord this morning and you need a healing in your body, I'm just going to ask you to step out in the aisle. We're going to anoint you with oil. If Brother Fred come down here with me. I don't know if Dan, Dan is in here. Just why don't you come up, folks, and we'll just line up here. We're going to anoint you with oil. We're going to take just a few minutes and pray for you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. God, we're excited, Lord. You are moving by your Holy Spirit across the land, Father. Your glory is going to shine around this earth, Lord. In the spite of all the evil that's happening, Lord, this is the greatest day to be alive, Father, for we will see you, our Heavenly Father, moving 
through your people in this last day. And Lord, everyone that came forward for a prayer this morning for healing, whatever it was, Lord, we speak it in the name of Jesus. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed. And we rebuke all demonic spirits of infirmities, of sickness, disease, cancers. You have to bow to the name of Jesus. Backaches. Lung disease, heart disease, you all have to bow in the name of Jesus. Cancers, be gone in Jesus' name. Infirmities that are holding on, they have to let go in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for that divine healing power. For it was finished on the cross, you said it is finished. And by faith, Lord, we're standing here, we're not begging you, we're thanking you for our healing right now. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for your touch. And we warfare in our spirits to receive what you already accomplished. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Lord Amen. bless. Please turn around and greet one another before you're seated. Well, good morning, Crossfire. Good morning. God bless each and every one of you, and thank you for being here this morning. And we want to just say welcome to our visitors that are here today, and I know we have a few. I've met them this morning. Uh, so let's welcome them. And also welcome to our, our visitors on um, Facebook and social media. We're glad that you can join us today. Just a reminder, if you could please silence your cell phones to not distract others during the service. If you have a prayer request, please fill out a card on the prayer box in the foyer and drop it in there. They get prayed over a lot. <laughs> um, also, you can submit a request to prayer at cfassembly.com. All requests are prayed over each week, so um, they do get covered in prayer. They get bathed in prayer. Join us Sunday mornings at 9.30 in the Lodge or online Sunday evenings, 6 p.m. via Zoom for prayer. Send a request to info at cfassembly.com for a link if you need one. The men's Bible study at the church meets Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. See Paul Ricca or Ken Zahorsky with questions. Hey, Terry, just back to you. They had their first one Wednesday night, right? It was awesome. Eight, nine guys show up. It's going to get gooder and gooder. If there's any guys who want to grow in the Lord, come on to a Bible study. I want to eventually incorporate that where women will have a meeting here on Wednesday nights. Other ministries can take place on a Wednesday night. That way we can have a church night for ministry. But this men's ministry is a starting, and, I, and as this grows, and I believe it will, because we have men of God leading it, we want to see God do work in guys. We want to see him to grow in the things of the Lord as well as our ladies. Amen? Amen. We're in important times, and we need to grow in the things of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Terry? Amen. <laughs> okay. um, the ladies will be starting the Elijah Bible Study Series on Saturday, September 2nd. 
Anyone who ordered and paid for the study book, please pick up your copy after the service from either Bonnie or Diana. Neither one of them are here. Can I Sorry. just say on that too? I was talking with Sandra. Where's Sandra? Is she back there? Sister Sandra, we were talking about it. She is excited, ladies, for the late, for this upcoming Bible study. So please sign up if you want. It's going to be an incredible time. And she said that God's just been really doing an awesome work in the ladies' ministry. Cool. All right. Um, Crossfire will be hosting a CPR first aid class on Saturday, October 14th at 9 a.m. The class will be on site at the church, and the cost is $130 per person for cert certification or $110 for non-certification. The course is approximately five hours long, and you'll need to bring your own lunch. So you, if you're interested in that, you can sign up at, at the table um, behind the sanctuary doors there. Or you can go online on the church calendar at www.cfassembly.com if you'd like to register for the class. Okay, at this time we're going to pray over the offering. Um, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the, the generosity of you, Lord God. The, the, you fulfill our desires. You fulfill our needs, Lord God. And we just thank you for everything that you have done for us, Lord and it all started at the cross. We thank you for that, Lord, and your precious blood that flowed down there. Father God, we bring our offerings to you, our tithes and offerings, Lord God, and we ask that you would bless gift and giver, Lord, and that it will be used um, uh, mightily for your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We can have the kids come up for Sunday school. Pray over them. Where's our future church leaders? Come on down. Heavenly Father, we just bring these little ones before you, Lord God, and we pray that as they hear your word today, that you would open their little hearts and their minds and their spirits, Lord God, to receive that, that word, and it would be planted deep in their hearts, Lord God, and that as they grow in you, Lord, that it will continue to blossom and to grow. We thank you for the teachers who work with them and, and take the time to love on them and, and to share the word with them. And we ask that you just be with them all today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Pastor? Thank you, Terry. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm excited about Jesus. Yes. That side isn't. I'm excited about Jesus. Ah, now it's getting balanced out here. I like that. That's good. That's good. Well, I'm really glad to see everyone here again today, and uh, God is on the move. And uh, praise the Lord. He's going to do some great things. And again, when you pray, pray for healing, we don't do the healing. Jesus did the healing. Amen? Yes. Don't be discouraged. Your prayers did go to heaven. God heard them this morning. You will walk in power and might. Amen? Yes. I tell you, if the world can uh, serve demons, we can sure serve Jesus. You know, the Walker Art Center, somebody brought to my attention last week, Walker Art Center, 
they're inviting families to come in and to uh, work with demons and, and get to know your demons, and they're friendly demons, and they want to get to know us. The devil is openly parading in this hour we're living. And there's families going and falling into it hook and sinker. Can't believe it. There's a city in Casadaga, uh, Casadaga Florida, that I was reading about that has 57 psychic and medium homes where you can go and get a reading, get healing in different things. And it's... And they had a, somebody from American uh, Magazine or whatever it was called, I believe, and they did a survey and found out that over 80% of the people coming there to visit these homes were people that call themselves Christians. Isn't that amazing? Don't fool around with demons. Amen. Those people in that city that are giving hand palm readings and that they're dealing with demonic spirits. And they can attach themselves to your life if you open your heart open to them and invite them. You got to be careful, people. I'm warning you, Satan is on the move. His time is short. He's bold right now. He's defeated, though. He doesn't, nobody told him that, but he's defeated. And we as Christians have got to begin to stand in the gap for our younger yeah. people yeah. that are being pulled into it through many different avenues right now, through concerts, through uh, meetings, through all different things, through yoga, other exercise things. They're being pulled in gradually, and it's all demonic inspired. Whether you want to believe that or not, or just think I'm a wacko, I'm a wacko. I believe it. Jesus believed it. He believed it. He warned people continually about the workings of Satan. And we're living there right now, people. And a lot of people have problems in their life. And one of those problems are they've been messing around with the wrong thing. They've got the wrong thing sitting in their house. And they haven't gotten rid of it that has demonic influence with on it. Where it can't, many times they don't understand that. You know, you go into a Chinese uh, food place whether it's Chinese, Taiwan, or whatever, and you go in there and they got Buddha sitting in there. They got apples and coins and stuff where people put around them and everything. I always go and lay a track on his head. <laughs> but my wife and I, whenever we would get food, we would pray over it and speak the blood of Jesus Christ over it. Amen. Amen. And rebuke any demonic spirit because if it was offered in any way through anybody working in the kitchen or outside, I don't know if there were or not. I mean, that's just the way that, you know, they like to show what type of restaurant they are. But we're, we're very careful of that. And even in your food that you eat today from the supermarket, you need to plead the blood of Jesus Christ over it every day because right now we have some horrible things going on in our nation and people are tampering even with our food supplies. No, I'm not paranoid. I'm not paranoid at all. I'm just telling you facts. Keep your discerning ears up and your eyes. We're living in very dangerous times right now, but it's times that we are the victors as we trust in the Lord. Amen? And we need to remember that going forward. But I tell you what, when they start inviting people to come over and then they tell you they're going to give you little boxes and everything you can take to your home, which is your little demo a demon box, and you can go and you can learn about your demon. There will be people that will do that. Even there will be Christians. There will be some that will go in there and do that because they curiosity. Yes. Curiosity killed the what? Yes. The Christian. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I'm excited about the Lord. Oh. See, even in the middle of any kind of warfare, we're in the end times. Uh, I was watching an, uh, a film about all the events happening around the world right now, weather events. And, uh, of course, there's all kinds of stuff going on about the government and some of it. But 
Uh, a lot of it can be from the Lord, too, allowing it to happen. In, I mean, hailstorms and volcanoes and flooding. And, I mean, China right now, you wouldn't believe the flooding there when you saw pictures of it. Unbelievable. Things are happening in the earth. The earth is crying out. Come and save us, God. And uh, that's why we're coming together in these last days as brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we are an army, and we are soldiers of the cross, and we yeah. need to go forward and win the lost. My, I, had an exci- I, I was kind of excited yesterday. I, I watched uh, two sermons of my pastor when I got saved as a young guy. My wife and I were 20, 21 years old. And I didn't know where the guy was, and I just kept fooling around. And I finally found the dude. He was a guest speaker in some church. Of course, he's in his late 80s right now, but he's still got the fire of God on him. And he's the one that helped me. I go to church just like this here and listen to him, just preach the word of God. That's all he did. And he loved the Lord. He wanted to talk about Jesus nonstop, didn't he? We go out to pizza with him, and this guy would talk about Jesus. Hallelujah. He didn't talk about the Vikings or the twins. He talked about Jesus. And, you know, I watched him walk across that stage. He said, I love people. And I want to win the souls of people that are destined to hell. Yeah. That's who I was trained under. We got to reach the lost. There's a dying world out there. You have dying family members. There may be somebody in here this morning. We want to win you to Jesus, to convince you. This world is going to come to a stop. Hallelujah. But it was refreshing to see a pastor that was on fire and still on fire into his late 80s. And he was a young guy when he was preaching to us. But he was, his heart was there. And I'll tell you where he's going right now. He's, he's probably already been there. He's in his 80s. He and his wife are going to New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, and the inner cities and preach the gospel to gang members. He wants to win these people to Jesus. He didn't retire. He said, as long as I can walk and talk, I want to win people to Jesus. That's somebody to follow. That's an example. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. I thank you, Lord, for every person here this morning. Those watching on Facebook, Lord, we acknowledge them. We thank you for their lives. And Father, I just lift all of us up before your throne and would cry out to you that your Holy Spirit would move upon us. Speak into our hearts. Lord, challenge us. Convict us if we need conviction, Lord. Father, you didn't come into the world to condemn us. You came here to save us, to save that which was lost. And Lord, you've given us a lot of people to win. And so we ought to be about your business. And I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will continue to challenge us to be people that will spread the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever we go and to live it out in front of people too, Father. So we commit this morning to you for your glory, your honor, and your praise. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody just yelled out. Amen. I like loud Pentecostal people. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm not done yet. I want you to wave at me so I know you're out there. And I'll put the other hand up. I can see more hands that way. And now just shout, praise the Lord. He heard that. Hallelujah. Tried by fire. Anybody ever been tried by fire? It isn't fun sometimes, is it? But I believe in my heart. I, I, was good, I had another message I was going to speak on today. And yesterday, uh, the Lord changed me in my tracks. And I thought, I'm going to give an encouraging word today. I do every Sunday, actually. Some people just don't know it. <laughs> but this one here... I, I really feel because of the hour we're living in and see what's happening in around the world right now, and Christians are under fire right now. Persecution is heated up around the world. 
Literally, things are happening. We're in a tough area right now in the world. And uh, many of it in the Christian's life, true born-again Christians, they are under fire. They are being tried by fire for a reason. Jesus is making preparation for us, and he's also helping us to get through these times that we're living in. And many times it comes through hardship. It comes through things that are happening in our life that we think that we can never overcome. But tried by fire. You know, Job had felt that his lot was unbearable too. He recovers himself here and he revises the outlook as you read the book of Job. And I'm not going to read the whole book of Job this morning. But Job 23.10 says, I like what Job says. He says, but he knoweth the way that I take when he had tried me. I shall come forth as gold. That's in a, that was somebody under fire. Though Job had felt that his lot was unbearable, he recovers. Despite his afflictions, Job was able to be optimistic. How many of us are optimistic when we're in the middle of a fire? It's hard to be optimistic, isn't it? It really is. He did not allow the afflictions to make a skeptic out of him and him and say, where's God? Where is he? Why doesn't he listen to me? Why me? He didn't become a skeptic in the middle of the storms of his life. He did not permit his trials and troubles through which he was passing to overwhelm him either. Job looked at the bright side of the dark cloud. We can look up and we can see the dark cloud over us many times, can't we? We can feel it. You can feel the darkness around you, a heaviness that comes upon your life. But Job, he didn't look at the dark side. He looked at the other side. Guess who the other side of the cloud is? God. He was looking on God's side. He could see the dark side, but he knew God was on the bright side. And that's what we need to remember, even in the middle of our trials, our tribulations. God is on the healing side. He sees it from a different perspective than we do because he's God. Hallelujah. For us, this side is only seen by faith. We have to believe that God knows what's happening to us. He sees what's happening to us, and he knows how to take care of it. We need to look from his side and understand. He's looking at that. He said, I'm the God of the impossible people. I can take care of anything in your life. No matter how bad your health may be, I can turn that health around and make it new. Because he's on the bright side of the clouds, and we need to remember that. We need to be encouraged in this time that we live. Some people say, well, how can I go witness when I don't feel good? How can I witness when I just... I'm under the weather all the time. That's what Satan tries to do to keep us out, down and out, to take away our testimony. Because even people, I've seen people that have been in serious things in their life, laying in a bed of sickness and still saying, praise the Lord. And they will even minister to other people, nurses, doctors. We have them within this own congregation that I've met, met with. And I don't want to say names because then I'll miss somebody. But we've got a lot of awesome young people in this church that have gone through the fire and have been testimonies to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the, uh, Daniel in, in uh, Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, it says, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remained there, was the king of Persia. That tells me that Daniel was a praying man. Prayed for 21 days. Most of us give up after a half hour when we don't get the answer. But Daniel prayed 21 days. 21 days on the other side, the bright side. Daniel's answer to his prayer was already, it was already issued from God. When you look at it from God's side, his prayer was already issued. And Daniel knew that. But Satan... He was trying, his forces, trying to withhold that. Because see, one thing the saint knows, he knows that God answers prayer. So what's he going to go after? A praying saint is a dangerous person to the kingdom of Satan. 
And that's, that is one of the things, I've said it over and over, is one of the lesser things that we do in our Christian faith is pray. And it's the very thing that Satan hates because he knows we're in communion with the God who took care of him right. and booted him out of heaven. And he's trying to take as many of us down with him as he can. And when you pray, he wants you to be discouraged. He wants you to, be, to give up as soon as possible when you're praying. Because if you hang in there like Daniel, that prayer is going to be manifest in your life. Not my promise, God's promise. He said, I not only hear, I answer. And we need to remember that too. But this shows us the insight into reality and the might of principalities and powers, rulers of Satan. It says in Ephesians 6, 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And many times Satan works through people. People are open to satanic things. And he will move through them. And it's not the person we're fighting, but there's an unseen force going on in the, behind the scenes. And we need to always remember that if someone's attacking us for some reason, or even if it's within our own mind or our thoughts, there's a satanic, demonic power that is trying to bring you down, to discourage you, to think, God, what's the sense of serving God? Nothing happens. That's a lie. That's a lie. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. But although Satan's not omnipresent, he is highly organized with his evil angels. He's been doing it a lot of centuries. He knows how to do it. He knows how to discourage you and I. The demons know, and they know that God is a God that answers prayer of his children. But here's how Job was able to be optimistic. The divine knowledge of my life, knowing that God knows, God created Job, didn't he? As he did every one of you and I. Job did not know the way he took. He, did not, he didn't understand. We don't know the way we're taking sometimes, do we? We don't know which way to go sometimes, but God does. Yes. That's why it's important. He was consciously making free will decisions and choosing to follow the Lord. Did you hear that? Job was choosing to follow God. It says in Job 23, 11, listen now, my foot hath held his steps, his way have I kept and not declined. That's important. My foot hath held his steps, his way have I kept, not declined. You want to know his steps where they're at? His footsteps are here. He tells us every place he's walking. His ways, he tells us what he's doing. It's all in here. Hallelujah. Praise God. Whatever fire your life is happening, hold to Jesus' steps and his ways. We have too many people who are praying and crying out to God today in our world that we're living, but they're not holding to God's ways. They're not holding to God's ways. They're doing their own thing. And then when trials and fire come, then they're praying to God. But they're not doing what Job did, holding to God's steps or his ways. We have too many people, and I'm, I'm not a negative person, but I'm telling you the truth. We have too much sin going on within the church. Too much. We got adultery. And think, people think God's winking. He isn't winking. He sees it all. He knows, but yet we'll cry out to God and expect him to answer our prayer and not realizing if you look at his steps, he said, your sins separate me from you. Yeah. Don't blame God sometimes when our sins aren't answered. Or not our sins, they're answered. <laughs> See, now you know I'm human. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. There's no other way. There's no other way to the Father. It's got to be God, Jesus' steps all the way to heaven and his way. He says, you got to do it my way if you want to go to heaven. I'm not ordering you to do it, Jesus said. He doesn't command us. 
He said, do it my way and you'll get to heaven. Don't do this, you'll end up in hell. But if you follow my steps and my ways, you'll get to heaven. And we play games with Jesus. We should not do that. If he says, do this, we should do that. If he said, don't do this, we shouldn't be doing it. But we we rebel against him. And I'm talking general church, not crossfire, because we all do it right. (laughs) No. Psalms chapter 37, verses 23, 24. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Hallelujah. We serve a victorious God, and we have a victorious life when we do it his way. Glory to God. However, Job did not know, and neither do we, what may occur in his life in the next moment. Job didn't know what was going to happen to him. Well, he's losing everything from bad to worse to worse and worse and worse and worse. I know English. I know that. (laughs) But Job had no idea. James 4.14 says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. We say we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to be here, we're going to whatever. We can't even do that. We've got to say, if it be your will. If, I, if somebody says, well, I see you tomorrow, I say, to God willing, I'll see you tomorrow. That's the only way I can say it, because I have no guarantee. And James 1, 4, 14 says it. Matthew 6, 34. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow. For the moral shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Don't worry about tomorrow. There's nothing you and I can do about it. What's happening in the world today, what they're predicting and all this stuff, the financial collapses and all the horrible things that are going to happen, don't worry yourself about it. Let the world worry about it. We don't have to do it because God's in control. Yes. Yes. If you're a born-again, blood-bought Christian, God's in control. Yes. If you're in the middle of a financial fire right now, God's in control. Yes. He owns everything. Yes. Cattle on a thousand hills. He owns all the gold and the silver. He owns it all. Yes. Don't concern yourself with it. Go to him in prayer. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen? you got to go to him in prayer. Prayer is vitally important. Job could not see God. He couldn't see him at all. How many would say with Job, I can't see you, Lord. I can't feel you, and I can't even hear you. You ever been there in your life? I have. That's where Job was. He could not see God. Job 23, 8, 9 says, Behold, I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, and I cannot see him. That's where Job was, in the middle of his fire. That's what he was thinking. So if you've been there, Job will understand. And now you might understand Job, too. If you look at your Bible right now, there's only one little sheet of paper between Malachi... And the last book of the Old Testament, which is, and Matthew, the first book, there's only one sheet that separates them. That one sheet of paper represents 400 years of silence by God. 400 years. The last time we hear God speak, he is in the book of Malachi. That's the last time he spoke. All you have to do is flip one page from Malachi to Matthew, and there's Jesus. That's all you got to do. There's Jesus. Is all you need to do is flip that page and you'll find Jesus. It was 400 year gap between the last time God spoke to the people of Israel and Jesus enters the scene. Thank God for Jesus. Oh, there was naysayers and said he's not coming. This promise deliver, he's not coming. And the people were crying out because they were in the fire of slavery and bondage for 400 years. 
looking for a deliverer. 400 years, where is he? Satan was attacking their mind. There's no deliverer. The soldier's coming. There's no deliverer. Don't fool yourselves. But guess who showed up? It was 400-year gap between the last time God spoke. Then they cried out. 400 years of silence. 400 years of questions. 400 years of darkness. 400 years of being alone. 400 years. You may feel like you are in the 400-year disconnect from God right now. You may feel that way in your life right now. 400 years since the promise from God and the fulfillment. 400 years from the prayers and the answer. 400 years from the brokenness and the healings. 400 years from lost to hope. 400 years wandering around waiting to hear, to feel the presence of God. You might be there today. It may seem like 400 years. So what do we do when we can't hear or sense the Lord? Well, one thing we can do, and you can look up later, Joshua 4, 7, it talks about the Israelites creating a memorial to remember what God has done. That's important. See, sometimes we have to go back and look at what God has done in our lives so we can remind ourselves that he's always faithful. Yes. And he'll do it again. If you're wondering, where is the answer? Where is the answer? Look back at past answers that he's done in your life. Look in the past and say, God met my need. He healed me. He delivered me. He protected me from evil people. That's what we need to do. If you haven't sensed God for a while, you wonder, does he really care about me? You've got to sit and look back in your life and say, and see when God has touched your life. And there's many, many things that you and I don't even know that he's done in our life that we've taken for granted. Job's friends misunderstood him, and they charged him that he had sinned and that he was a hypocrite. His friends. But God knew. God knew. Job 23.10, But he knoweth the way that I take, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Those weren't much good friends at that point in Job's life. They were bringing a negative tone to him, trying to bring Satan working through them, trying to bring doubt, frustration, and fear. Why not give up? But Job didn't. He said, but he knoweth the way that I take. He had his mind on God. Job's faith is still strong here at that point. And by this time, he's beginning to sense that his suffering somehow are being used by God as a test of his faith. If you're here this morning and you're walking through health problems and things that, I, that only you know about, whatever, financial, relational, whatever it might be, and you've been doing everything within your power to serve and to love and to live for the Lord. But why are these things happening to me? You have to get to the point like Job and realize that God is allowing it for a purpose to test your faith. And your faith is going to do what? It's going to become forth like gold. He's growing our faith in the midst of the fire. In the trouble, the heartache in your family, in your homes, whatever's happening, the thing that you can't, I just, you don't understand it and you cry out and that's what God is really doing because he loves us so much. He wants our faith to grow. And we say, how can God allow that? That's destroying me. No, it doesn't. It doesn't destroy you. The only people who get destroyed is those who want to rebel against God and they go against him. But the righteous God's working in our life. And the hardest things in our life, when we continue to stay true to him, will turn out for good. They will. See, God could see Job. Job couldn't see God. But God could see Job. Isn't that refreshing? God saw him. Though I cannot see God, what is a thousand times better that he sees me? Isn't that better? I'm thankful that God can see me and he sees me. He sees you. He sees everyone that's sitting in here today and you feel alienated by friends or family or whatever. God sees you. Every one of you. 
He tells us, and he even notices when the sparrow falls to the ground. Matthew 10, 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? A farthing is, by the way, one and a half cents. And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Why would God care about a one and a half cent sparrow? Well, actually, it's less than that. That was two sparrows. I caught that even before I heard the giggles. But I tell you what, God cares about the sparrows. God deeply cares about every creature that he created. Yes. He tells us in Matthew chapter 10, 30, 31, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Did you know that? Every hair on our head is numbered, even us guys who have lost a lot. <laughs> the ones that are gone got numbers on them. God knows where to find them. <laughs> it's a hairy situation for me, not, not for God. <laughs> but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore ye are of more value than many sparrows. That's what God thinks of you. It's also recorded in Luke chapter 12, 6 and 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Not forgotten. God hasn't forgotten one of those sparrows. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Whatever you're going through, God knows, he cares, he understands, and he's looking at you from his side, and he's the answer. Well, people may overlook sparrows, and you and I do. We see those little bitty birds flying all around. I'm guilty to say I shot many of them with BB guns when I lived on the farm, and I ask God to forgive me. I love sparrows now. I got them outside my office window, where the uh, lower part of my home where I do my messages and stuff, and while I'm sitting there, I got a bunch of sparrows flying around and they're having fun in the bush there and they're in my little bird bath and the little guys are so cute and I say Lord forgive me for everyone I shot for every one of those I shot you watched them fall to the ground and now you see all these little sparrows flying around my house right now and you know every one of them and you haven't forgotten one of them how important that we must be to God Like Job, he knows the way that I take. Understand Job 1.1, it says, Job was a perfect and upright man, but he was being tried by fire. Like Job, friends, your friends, listen now. Your fellow Christians, they may misunderstand you, but console yourself with the blessed fact that an omniscient one knows you. Yes. I'm going to have Amy sing a old hymn that I, I found that I think is awesome by Charles Albert Tinley. So go ahead, Amy. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me, like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the hosts of hell sail, and my strength to fail Thou who never lost a battle stand by me In the midst of faults and failures stand by me In the midst of faults and failures stand by me When I do the best I can and my friends misunderstand Thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, 
execution stand by me when my flaws in battle array undertake me to stop the way thou who save it Paul and Silas stand by me when I'm growing old Hallelujah. Thank you, Amy. All your faults and failures, he still loves us. He stands by us. Don't tear yourself down. Don't let the enemy make you think you're worthless. God always stands by you. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our faults. He knows everything that happens to us. And he stands by us. Amen. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful hymn? Does it cause you distress or comfort knowing that God knows everything about you? Hmm? <laughs> Amen. Amen. You, th you think nobody sees, but, but he, he does. He's there. He sees everything that you and I do. He even knows our thoughts. He knows when we're laughing in a service like this when we should be serious. Because the Holy Spirit wants to do a work in distraction many times will the enemy will bring into a church to try to stop people from receiving the word of God. He will bring distraction even using you and I to do it. Because somebody that is being distracted really needs to hear that word. And I'm not afraid to bring that distraction open. Because it's serious things people are going through right now. And it, I don't care if you're in here, you're young, and you think, well, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm strong, I'm vibrant, I can, yeah, I got the whole world in front of me. Do you? I just read this morning a report of a 16-year-old boy that killed an 18-year-old girl, hit, him, hit her with his truck. I don't think he set out in the morning to do that, but it happened. But they're gone. Anything can happen to us. So I ask you, Listen, because it's vitally important for the young and the old. We're living in serious times. And your faith is, you young people, you think you've got problems now? Should Jesus tarry? The world's getting darker and darker. There's going to be coming things that you're going to cry out and say, what's happening? Yeah. Mommy, Daddy. They might not be there anymore. Yeah. And we need to be aware of that. God knows the very hearts of men. He knows us inside and out. Genesis 18, 19, he says, for I know him, that he will command, he's talking about Abraham, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. But I want to point out here, this is vitally important, is that this is the first specific reference in the Bible to the teaching of children. And it's the father's responsibility to do it. Psalms chapter 139, verses 1 and 5. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compass my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast best set me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Boy, God's got us covered, doesn't he? Hallelujah. Psalms 1, 6. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. There are two ways. Choose his way. Amen. Choose God's way. Matthew 7, 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. Matthew 7, 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. We're watching it happen in our world today. 
Are you saying that few will be saved? No. The one who said, I am the door, said few would find it. Jesus said that, the door. He said few are going to come through the door. That's scary, isn't it? A man may persuade himself that his sin, easily besetting sin, that his evil dealings, his false religion, his selfish ways are right, but whatever is not God's way will end in death. And that's where we're living today, even within churches that Christians that are going through the fire. Pastors stand behind pulpits and try to make excuses for you and I to live beneath who God is. And trying to justify sin within our life, saying he's a loving God and he is a loving God. He loves us so much that he warned us about the narrow and the broad path. That's the loving God we serve. It isn't the pastor that loves his congregation that doesn't warn them. A pastor that loves his congregation will warn them to realize that there's going to be a payday, which I'll be having a sermon on that. Divine testing. When he hath tried me, Proverbs 17, 3 says, the finding pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. This was God's way with Israel of old, and it's his way with Christians now. It says in 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. When we stand before the Lord, the trials and the testings that you and I went through that we didn't understand, that we cried out to God, when we make it to heaven and we stand before him, he's going to say, you made it. I knew you would, like Mike Lindell says about the pillow. <laughs> because when, you're, when you have the Lord Jesus Christ on your side, you're going to make it. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery tri trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Every trial that you and I have in this world, someone's got it just like you do. Many people. They're struggling with the same things. They're dealing with the same things, and some are crying out, are we going to make? The only ones who don't make it are the ones who turn away from God Amen. through the fire. They lose their faith because they looked away, and they looked to something else. Just before Israel entered Canaan, as Moses reviewed their history since leaving Egypt, he said in Deuteronomy 8.2, And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee, to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandment or no. And some of us that are walked through the wilderness longer than we think we should be, God's got you there because he's proving us. He's allowed. He said, how long will they trust me? Will they give up on me? Forty years in the wilderness, God tested the people. Forty years when he could have easily walked them through in three days. But 40 years. And if you're in the middle of that fire right now, people, take heart. God knows. And if you, he's talking to you through your Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, saying, Lord, why am I in this fire? Why am I in this trial right now? Listen. He will tell you. And he will show you and he will lead the way out of it. We need to learn, don't we? The daily irritations of life, the things which annoy you so much, what's their meaning? Why are they permitted? Here's one answer. God's trying you. He does that on purpose. His people. This is the explanation in at least part of those disappointing and crushing earthly hopes that you and I have. God was and is, God was and is testing us. And he's going to keep doing it because he wants this to come forth as gold. Amen. 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 Psalm 6610, for thou, O God, hast proved us, thou hast tried us as silver is tried. 
Psalms 17.3, thou hast proved mine heart, thou hast visited me in the night, thou hast tried me and shall find nothing. I am per- purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. God tries us. Repeatedly he tells us that. Tried, tested to see what you would do in a particular situation of life. He will allow certain things to come in. He doesn't do them, but he allows them to see how are we going to respond. Are we going to fall back into the sin? Are we going to turn our backs on him? Are we going to follow the devil? It's sad when you hear Christians say, I once followed Jesus, but it didn't work. Well, for crying out loud, man, following Satan is going to help. (laughs) Did Job have impurities? He didn't. God says he was just and upright. Why would he have to walk through all these horrible things in his life? The infirmities, the sicknesses, losing his family, his earthly blood, everything, he lost it all. He's the one, <laughs> he's the one you got to start looking at and say, was God involved in his life? Yeah, he's the one that could have said, there's no God, but he didn't. He knew that God was doing something in him. He didn't know what, but he knew God was at work. And losing everything, he stayed faithful to God. How many have drawn strength and encouragement from this man called Job? I have. When you go, you think you got it bad, read the book of Job. Next time you start complaining and murmuring, start reading the book of Job and start realizing there's a man who could have been murmuring and complaining. Job was able to endure great trials because he was a great man. Trials are proportionate to the individual, by the way. They're custom made. They're custom made. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There had no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. He's always looking for a way for you to make it. When you say, I can't make it anymore, God's saying, you can make it. I'm going to give you a way, and you'll know it when you get there. Temptation, not to sin, but proving, refining process is what God does. God does not tempt man in the sense of sin. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Who's Who's he going to give it to? To those that love him. A crown of life. So all the things that you and I walk through and we can't understand it or or anything, one day we'll stand before him and he's going to give us the crown of life. It was worth it to trust Jesus, amen? It was worth it to trust Jesus. Glory to God. Our standing depends on our faith and our union with God and our steadfastness in prayer. We need to be a praying people. We need to be a praying people. You know, every morning when we have prayer down here in the church before service, and every Sunday night at 6 when we have prayer, there's a lot of prayers said, and there's a lot of prayers answered. And some of the prayers in here that may have been answered may be because of the people that are on there praying. Amen? Or even yourself, if you're praying at home. Prayers are vitally important. Think if we didn't have any prayers. You'd have some real problems. God answers prayers. The greatest saint can stand only as long as he depends upon God and continues in the obedience to the gospel. Obedience to the gospel. Well, you don't like to hear that word, obedience. But there's so many disobedient children right now They're doing things they want to do, and I'll do it if I want to do it. God ain't stopping me and nobody else. Well, the wages of sin. Payday doesn't always come on Friday, but it'll eventually catch up. And that's, I'm just simply being honest. If you want to see you get through a trial in your life, be obedient to God. Just say, God, Heavenly Father, you're... You're doing something in me, and I don't know what that is, and I don't know why it is, but I'm going to trust you. I don't need to go back to the booze bottle. 
I don't need to go back to gambling. I don't need to go back to any other thing. I need to go to you. I don't need to go back to the internet. I don't need pornography to get my mind distracted. I don't need to go to yoga to get my mind cleaned out. You go to Jesus. Abraham, he endured great trials, producing and exercising great faith, and God brought him a great nation. Hebrews 11, 7, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, his son. And he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. That's our Lord. You may have a question, but don't question God in that sense. Don't inquire of God in a trial. To, in, to inquire of God in a trial is one thing, but to question who he is. I don't think it's smart. Hebrews eleven seventeen 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. He didn't question God. James 1, 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally and upbraideth not. That means to scold or to find fault and shall be given you. If you ask him, he'll give it to you. Wisdom is the sense of what God's direction and purpose in the matter of trial taking place. He gives us the wisdom when we're walking in the trial to understand it related to his word. His wisdom, his Holy Spirit begins to give us the wisdom we need to stand fast as we're walking through the trial. Young people in here, you go to school or Whatever, there's going to be all kinds of things presented to you to distract you away from God. All kinds of things. Psychology, psychology. The great physician knows more than the psychologist. You need to run to Jesus. If you are fearful, you need to run to Jesus. If you have doubt about your tomorrow, about the future of your life, you need to run to Jesus. You need to run to a brother or sister in Christ that you can trust and pour out your heart to them and let them pray with you and to get you through that trial, that time of your life, and you'll have victory and you'll see that when you do that, that every time you run to God, you get victory. Because many are the trials and tribulations of the righteous, but my God delivers us from all of them. All of them. Wisdom, I'm braided not. He's not going to scold or fault us for asking for it. That is God's will, not to scold you for asking and understanding direction. To question God's authority or knowledge is another. Romans 9.20 says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that thou repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me? Remember, the Lord answered Job's plea for understanding in Job's 30, uh, I think it's chapter 38 through 41 when you read that, talking about the creation and everything God's showing Job. Romans 9, 21 says, Has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? That's God's right. He's God. So in conclusion, I'll stop it here. I'm going to come... Fourth, as gold. When every trial that I've been in, every trial that you've been in, we're going to come forth as gold. And many of you have been in trials, especially the older folk in here, have been through many trials throughout your life. Family problems, financial problems, health problems, work problems, every kind of trial you can think of. You'll wonder, why is it happening to me? Maybe you're born with something that you say, why, God, why did you allow that in me? God sees something special. And you were born for a purpose, and he will accomplish that. And when you stand before him one day, you're going to come forth as gold, and he's going to look at you and say, you made it. You accomplished what I set forth in your life on this earth. Don't struggle through it, but trust him. Not I might, I hope to, but I shall come forth as gold. I'm going to come forth as gold. Remember, Job had full assurance that God knew the way that he was taking and that he would come forth as gold. So then be of good cheer, people. God knows the way that he's called you to take. Trust him. The process may be unpleasant and it may be painful, but the end of the situation is you will come forth as gold. 
for the future, this is sure, but the most wonderful thing in heaven will not be the golden streets or the golden harps or the golden souls on which is stamped, that the golden souls which are stamped by God will be the greatest gold in heaven. You and I, as we come forth as gold, amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Amen. If you're in a trial of fire today, let's all stand and, and uh, if, there's a, if there's things going on in your life, let's go before him right now because, see, Job had to come before God. He knew that God was there even though he couldn't feel him and he couldn't sense him. He just knew that he knew that anyone that's here this morning, and I think I love these altars. I'm going to be using these altars as I have been even more and more because I think this is where the Holy Spirit is leading churches back to is the altars. That if you have got a trial in your life and you want to come forth with other brothers and sisters in Christ and we're going to pray together, God is going to be here ready. So I want you to just come forth. I'm already up here. See, I, it's easy for me. I'm here. But if you've got trials, you've got something going on in your personal lives, you need to come up here because that could be a thing that God is doing a work in your life and he's going to bring about victory. Maybe you need a new job. Maybe you need something in your life and you've been struggling so hard where you've been. God maybe allowed that, but he's going to open a new door too. Is there anybody else? You've been depressed. You've been walking through oppression. There's young people that go through depression, oppression. Don't let your pride keep you from the altar. That's, saint, that's Satan. Pride is Satan. If you want to hold back, you're only representing the pride that Satan offers. It takes men and women that come forth and are willing to look at the brothers and sisters like that, like Job, his friend said, oh, you must be a hypocrite or you must be sin in your life. So what do they think? Who cares? I've been accused of many things in my Christian life. I only care what he thinks. You want to think I'm a hypocrite? You go ahead and think it. You want to think I'm a uh, low-down sinner? You go ahead and think whatever you want, but I care what he thinks. <clears throat> Maybe you've been ridiculed all your life. Maybe you've been put down by people. God wants to bring some healing this morning. You've been raised in a home with no father, no mother, or whatever, and you've struggled with that all your life. That's a trial and a test. They can go for years. Like Job, he knows the way I take, the path I take. God is here right now. The Holy Spirit's here. You that are sitting in your chairs, pray for these people up here too. See, God's going to be doing some work in here and he's going to be bringing answers as the days go by. He's going to be bringing healing. He's going to be bringing a deliverances. He's going to be doing something supernaturally. You may say, well, I don't see it. I don't feel it. I don't hear it. Neither did Job. But what happened to Job? We know his end, don't we? God blessed him mightily because he stood true and steadfast. Hallelujah. In fact, people, you that are supposedly God, God's blessing your life and everything, I want you to come forward because these are we're a family here. I want you to come forward with me and I want you to just put your hand on somebody's shoulder here and pray with me as I pray this morning. That there's, We care about everybody here. We care about every single person that's in this building. So church, let's be the church this morning. I don't care. Just put your hand on somebody's shoulder. Let them know. We want to agree in prayer. Pray one for another that you may be healed. Hallelujah. Okay, we're going to pray. You that are sitting there, please pray with us. Reach forward. Holy Spirit, you're here. You're ready to hear the hearts. As I'm praying my prayer, Lord, my prayer isn't important above anybody's here, but I'm leading, Father, and I'm going to pray a prayer to you for my brothers and sisters. And Lord, you're going to hear their prayers, their personal prayers in their hearts right now. 
as we go to you. For we're looking for your help, your deliverance. We're looking for you to intercede in our lives. Heavenly Father, thank you for being here this morning with us. Lord, even though the Israelites couldn't see or feel or sense you for 400 years and they cried out and said, where's the deliverer? Where's the deliverer? Deliver us, God. Heal us, God. Bring peace to us, God. Set us free. Where are you, God? 400 years, Lord, you heard them. But you had a purpose and a plan because you saw it from your side. And then we turn the page and here you sent your son, Jesus. Our healer, our deliverer, our helper, our joy, our peace, our calm, our future, our true love, our doctor, our counselor. He walked amongst us and you sent him and he's here today because Jesus said, I will go away and I will send you a comforter. And Lord, right now, the Holy Spirit is here with my brothers and sisters. And Lord, you're going to move within them. Some may sense, some may not. That doesn't make any difference because your word tells us that the just shall walk by faith, not by sight or feelings. But Lord, you're building their faith. Our faith is being grown when we don't feel or sense you, but we know you're here. And Lord, right now, supernaturally, I believe you're doing a work in every heart of every person that's standing up here with every situation they're walking through. And Lord, there may be some up here this morning that created some of their own problems, and they, that's the ones they just need to go to you and ask for forgiveness and get it behind them. Get the blood of Jesus to wash it away if they rebelled and they're living in rebellion. Let them go to you and repent. For Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But all of us, Lord, are going through trials of not our own making and we just don't understand it. Those are the ones, Lord, you're here this morning and you're saying, I am. I am that I am. I am the source. I am the deliverer. I am the one that is making you into gold. You are shining forth into heaven as I make you into shiny gold. I'm preparing you, the Lord says, for my home to live with me for all eternity. But I want your faith full and tried in fire where all the impurities are gone. And it may hurt but you'll see at the end of the trip when you get here how great and merciful and kind I was to you and why I needed to do what I did to prepare you for this place that you're coming to for it is pure and holy. Lord, put that deep within the hearts of the people here this morning. Let them put their hands up to you right now. Tip their hands up toward heaven. Tip them up toward heaven. And say, Lord, here's my trial. Here's my faith. I give it to you, Lord, to help me through this time. Help me to keep my faith strong. Help me to walk steadfast during this time. Help me to know that you are the true source that will give me the victory. Let the salve the balm of Gilead flow over each person here, Father. Let him sense your power and your presence as you move amongst us. And Lord, as the people leave this morning from this service, Lord, you're going to be with them. For you are making a path for them to be on, to follow in your steps and in your ways, that if they've been slack in prayer and reading your word, Lord, that you will return their hearts to you. And these people here will be joyous. Abundant joy will flow from their hearts. 
Lord, the enemy has a plan to stop us, to allow our trials to bring us down, to lose our testimony to a lost and dying world. But Lord, help us to show that in the middle of our trials, we still trust you. And we will tell the sinner, I trust in the Lord. They may say, but you're going through this deep trial. How can you trust God? And you can say, I trust him because he's proven himself faithful and true. And I'm going to trust him no matter what, no matter what discouragement you try to say to me, I'm going to tell you that God is faithful. Every demon spirit of hell that is trying to use the trial that God has permitted, we command you in the name of Jesus to let go of minds and hearts right now. And Lord, that you would give everyone the strength and the ability to walk through. As Paul said, you said to Paul, my grace, meaning your ability, is enough. Your ability is enough to get us through everything we need to go through. So, Lord, with your help, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we right now tell you we put our trust in you and we'll turn away from things we shouldn't have been doing, repenting of things we shouldn't have been doing, in order that we not confuse this trial with sinful acts, but that we're truly coming before you as Job did, saying, Lord, you know my ways. So, Lord, we want to thank you. We want to praise you for we're in this fallen world and you're doing a work in us. Before you come back shortly, you're doing a work in your children and we're going to be a bunch of gold nuggets in heaven. And we thank you and we praise you. And we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. And Lord, I receive your healing. I receive your power. I receive your anointing. I receive your deliverance in my life. I will not depend upon man. I will depend upon you. I will walk in faith. I will walk in strength. I will walk in joy. I will walk in peace. I will walk in calm. I will walk in wisdom of the Holy Spirit going forward. As you work in my life, Lord. Hallelujah. And now, Lord, I just thank you. We thank you. And praise you for being with us this day. And help us to remember in the trials, the fiery trials, Lord. As Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego knew, even in the middle of the fire, you were there with them. And you're here today with every person that's been struggling in their faith. Right now, we can assure them that you are there with them and your Holy Spirit will confirm that to them, that no matter how severe that fire gets, that you're there and you'll never leave them nor will you forsake them. And not one hair of their head will be singed from the trial that I'm taking them through. Lord, I thank you and I praise you. Touch every home. Bless every home, financially, spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally. Lord, let the power of your Holy Spirit move through us, the church. Lord, I believe that you're going to be doing some supernatural works. Suddenly and quickly. Suddenly and quickly. Lord, you are the God that is the God of the impossible. You say, is nothing impossible for me? You tell us, is my arm shortened where I cannot do what I said I would do. Lord, I'm excited for we serve a living God that is going to be doing some great things within the people within this church and other churches where the pastor and the people are putting their trust in you. Remnant churches on fire for you of the glory of God is going to show up. Hallelujah. I want to tell you this real quick, people, before we go. This pastor I was had in my life, he told a story that I wasn't aware of. But this is God. He was like me. He was part-time when he started his ministry and doing a church and everything and working in the mines. And pretty soon he was getting ready to leave and all of a sudden this uh, young girl calls him up and said, Pastor, you need to come to my home. My mother died. The father wants you to come and be with us right now. And he said, I got to get to work. 
It's 40 miles away. I got to go to work. She's dead. What can I do? He said, you ever be unspiritual? We all do. Anyway, long story, he traveled there, went into the house. The father, the husband took him into the room. The mother was laying there dead for over an hour. He just said he didn't know what to do. Another one of those unspiritual moments. I didn't know what to do. So I took this lady's dead hand that was stiff. I put it in my hand and he said, in the name of Jesus, I command life to come back into this body. And she sat up. She's 87 years old today. Let's not take God for granted. Whatever we're going through, God can change it in the twinkling of an eye. And he can change your and my circumstances so quickly. But we give up on him. But there's a reason why he's delayed in many of our lives. And it's only to make us stronger and better people for him. To glorify him and to live with him. And to be used of him to reach a lost world. But I wanted to tell you that for encouragement because this is a true story. That wasn't a fake. I knew this pastor. I knew his faith. And when he was honest with God, he said, God, I don't know what to do. God says, I do. He said, I am the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I know what to do. God is the resurrection and life in these people's lives right now and everything we're walking through. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the, the deliverer, the helper in the time of trouble. So we can leave here today with joy in our hearts knowing we serve a mighty God. Don't let the devil browbeat you. Don't let him bring you down. Don't let doubt come back into your heart when you walk out that door. When doubt tries to come, you rebuke it in the name of Jesus and say, Lord, I'm going to walk according to your word. I'm going to walk with Brother Job. He struggled, but he made it all the way through to the end. And he trusted God. All through scripture, many times, God says, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Look at somebody and say, I'm going to make it with the Lord's help, with the Lord's help. Thanks for coming today. The Lord bless you. Hallelujah. Glory to God.